Good morning. Welcome to the first Friday devotion of the year. It was wonderful to be together for Tuesday devotion. And before Christianity and Law, we begin with another devotion. It is a, a, a symbol to us to gather together in a room like this and to be together worshiping God. It's a, a symbol for what we're doing all the time as we study law. Law is one way to worship God, and we should approach it in that spirit. But sometimes it's wonderful to gather together and, and see ourselves together. Usually we're spread apart, but here we can, we can be together and we can put into a, an audible, something we can hear in visual form, our constant worship before Christ in all we do. So let's pray and then we will sing to the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for gathering us together as lawyers, not unguided or unshepherded or unled, uh, but gathered together, serving Jesus Christ, loving him, admiring him, giving him all of our hearts and minds and will and spirit. Our Father in heaven, it's our, our prayer that in all we do, we can glorify you, that in every good thing we have, we can return praise to you. So lift up our hearts, Lord, so that we can enjoy you, so that we can appreciate all of your goodness so that seeking after the, the good, the love, the wonder that you are can be the motivation of all we do in life. Our Father in heaven, bless us with this spirit now as we raise our voices to praise you and to worship you in song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise together and worship. This semester we'll be um, reading through this book, The Mosaic Polity, or Observations on the Mosaic Polity by Franciscus Junius, one of the pillars of the, the Reformation. As I explained in the, the email to you, you'll get a, a reading list uh, next, next week, but it'll be about 10 pages a, a week. Uh, one week this semester, we'll have an exciting guest lecturer, a wonderful Christian uh, legal theorist from Australia, Nicholas Aroni, who's a professor at the University of Queensland, who will be visiting us. Um, he'll have a wonderful talk for us. But this will be our, our base reading for the, the course. And it concerns a, a, a pivotal question for, for Christians, which is how to understand the, the ways in which the Mosaic Law continues to provide for us a guidance, uh, a measure for our, our sinfulness, a standard uh, to constrain our, our appetites and our lusts and, and desires, all of these things. Um, in some ways, the, the Mosaic Law continues to do all these things, and in some ways it does not. Uh, and this book provides a, a systematic account of those, of those issues. It will, it will change your perspective on a number of, of issues. Uh, the sophistication of the account is very, very interesting. Uh, it will give you guidance about how to think, about how to apply the, the Law of Moses to your life. Uh, but it also proceeds in a way that uh, illustrates and expounds upon certain general jurisprudential concepts that have nothing to do with the law of Moses, but uh, frame the way you approach any system of law, including any contemporary system of law. So it will do a double duty for us, both as a, uh, the proper question of the book, which is how do we understand how the Mosaic law comes forward and continues to guide us, but it will also provide us with a certain general framework for the understanding of, of legal systems universally, because that's the method in which it, it proceeds, is first to think about laws, legal systems generally, and then to think about um, how the Mosaic Law uh, continues or does not continue to guide and to, to bind. You can buy this book uh, through a number of sources. Um, I've given you a link to, to one source to buy it. You can either buy a physical copy, like this one, handsome, beautiful, right, very attractive, uh, or you can buy it on uh, Kindle. You can, there are electronic editions that you can buy, but do one or the other. I would recommend that you get the, the paper copy because the readings will be uh, according to the pages in this book. So if you can get the, the paper copy, get the paper copy. And the, the first uh, two readings are very short, and so I'll, I'll provide you those, those readings so you have plenty of time for the book to come 
And of course, if you buy the Kindle edition, it will come instantly. So you have plenty of time for that as well. If you have any other questions about that, you can send me an email or, or talk to the, to the office. Uh, today, we're going to begin uh, with a, uh, an essay that I wrote uh, over the break for the Christian Legal Society in the United States. Uh, they were doing an edition on various, wanting various introductions to various uh, topics, and they asked me to write an introduction to Christian legal theory generally. And this was the essay that I, I composed in response to that uh, request. It's the U.S. Christian Legal Society, which has been a great friend of our law school. Our founding dean was the original uh, head of the Christian Legal Society in the United States, and they've been great friends uh, to us ever, ever since. Uh, the reason I wanted to share this, this essay with, with you is because uh, in the course of our study of Junius in, in, this, in this little book, um, you might become confused or you might not see the connection between what we're doing as we investigate the nature of law and the specific question about how the Mosaic Law comes forward, and what I believe is central to your hearts and should be central to your hearts, which is our faith in Jesus Christ, our, our hope uh, that we have through him, and the, the love that comes out of our, our hearts as we uh, follow him and put our, our hope in, in him. Uh, and this essay is just to, to remind us uh, how the, the love of Christ, the praise of Christ, the worship of Christ is central to what we do. And as you'll see in the course of this, and later as you reflect on what Junius has to say, uh, Christ is all throughout Junius. Uh, the, the reasons, all the reasons why certain things are universal across legal systems and other things are not uh, can be expounded equally in terms of their relation to Christ. Uh, specifically, as you read about Junius, you'll encounter this when we talk about what he calls the eternal law, which in, in this essay I, I talk about some as well in terms of the relation to Jesus Christ. So this essay is supposed to put a pressure on you all semester long. As we're, we're reading Junius, one of the things you want to be th thinking about is uh, how in, in all that we are doing as we read through Junius, how are we still placing Christ at the center of, of what, we're, what we're doing? And so I, I sent you this uh, essay, and if you want to follow along, I'll be, I'll be moving uh, through that and giving you indications of what, what page I'm on as I, I talk you through it. So the essay is entitled, An Introduction to Christian Legal Theory, Law and the Praise of God. And I begin with a, a quote from Romans chapter 1136. Romans 1136 is the culmination of a, a, a great uh, exhalation of praise by Paul, a, a great sighing, wonderful reflection on, on God where he says, oh my goodness, the depth and the riches and the, the greatness of the wisdom, the knowledge, the goodness of God, how can any of us begin to, to fathom it? How can any of us uh, seek to encompass the whole of it? And he concludes this litany of praise with uh, this line, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. A great uh, theologian of the early church, uh, Augustine, wrote a commentary on these verses in his work on true religion. And he asks, well, what is meant by to Christ be the glory? What does it mean to Christ be the glory? What does it mean except to him be the chief and perfect and widespread praise? Praise of Christ should be chief. It should be the highest thing we praise. It should be perfect. We should, we should ensure that it is the most perfect praise we, we offer, and it should be the most widespread. Why would we do this? Why do we care about, about praise? For as praise improves, 
in quality and extends in quantity, so love and affection increase in fervor. And when this is the case, mankind cannot but advance with sure and firm step to a life of love and joy. In other words, Augustine says, look, here's a basic psychological thing. As you begin to praise something more and more in your heart, you love it more. You take more joy in it. What you never praise, what you never consider in its aspect of goodness, you don't experience joy with. If you extend your praise, if you improve your praise of Christ, if you spend more time praising Christ in your heart, if you uh, are complete in the ways that you praise Christ for all the things that he does for you, your love of him will increase and your joy in him will increase. Christ is the one in whom you can give praise and thanksgiving. You can experience joy and an increase of love in all situations. So, you praise increasing is a, a naturally related to your joy and your love increasing. And then I just conclude with, with this uh, cry aloud of the people who are, are gathered at the end of times, at the, the judgment of the, the world as they see Christ coming again. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad. Let us give him glory. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus in his culmination is like an occasion for gladness, joy, rejoicing. And when they look upon him, they see something quite relevant to us. Above every king, above every ruler, above every legislator, above every judge, there is Christ, ruling them as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this is part of our reason for praising. Amen? So I, I begin the essay with, with a question. What is the, the basis of the fundamental unity of Christian legal theory? What is its essence? What is it that sets it apart? And I offer this initial uh, idea. The, the legal theory of Christians, our joyful jurisprudence, shows the law in relation to Jesus Christ. Simple idea. Christian legal theory, it should have something to do with law and Christ. It should relate those two things together. Basic idea. What does a Christian legal theory do? Theory, in Greek, means to show. It means to, to reveal, to let be seen. We let the law be seen in relation to Christ and Christ in relationship to, to the law. Now because uh, of, of what we already know about our, our relation to Christ, we should already be praising Christ generally with respect to everything. Basic, basic biblical teaching that we should rejoice in everything, that we should give thanks to Christ in everything. Why is this? Uh, life is varied. Uh, sometimes I sin. Sometimes I suffer. Sometimes I, I think of myself in terms of, of my life, but sometimes I think of myself in terms of my death. Sometimes I'm healthy. Sometimes I'm, I'm sick. But why is it that we can rejoice in Christ, praise him, and give thanks in all things? And we know the answer to this. We've been redeemed. We've been set free. We've been given eternal life. We've been given forgiveness of sins. Yes, you are... You are dead in your sins, but you are alive in Christ. Yes, you could look on yourself and see yourself as worthy of judgment, but in Jesus Christ, you can look on yourself and see yourself as a beloved, forgiven child of God. There is nothing, nothing that can separate us in any circumstances from an occasion to give praise to God. Why? Because in Christ, his love shatters our sin, his love shatters our death, his love shatters every oppression, 
His love is greater than any other blessing we have. There is no great blessing. There's no good thing you have in life that doesn't also pale in comparison to the good things that you have in Jesus Christ. Our proper response to this? Well, you should be grateful. If I give you a gift, you should be grateful. If a, a good thing is given to you, you should return the good feeling that was extended to you. There's something deeply wrong with you. There's a sickness in you. There's something problematic. If in the goods of life, you can't rejoice. There's something ethically problematic about you. If when somebody gives you something graciously and, and gives good to you, you return only scorn or sneers or ingratitude or you don't think about that. God has done the most wonderful thing for you. It is part of a basic health. It is part of a basic human reaction to return that to him in, in praise. I quote, among many verses I could quote, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, verse, uh, footnote 3, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances a basic ethical component of what we do, the religious side of our ethics. How is it that we should relate to God? In Jesus Christ, we should relate with joy, with prayer, with thanksgiving. Amen? Well, uh, if this is all a basic part of our relation to, to Christ, when we turn to, to law, things don't become radically different. For our, our legal theory to be Christian, and this is going to be true even with Christians who disagree about what the law is. This is going to be true with, with Christians. Some people view the law this way. Some people view the law that way. Some Christians think that this is the best way to proceed in legal matters. Some think it's this way to proceed in legal matters. We can have disputes about these things. But there is no room for dispute. That to the extent we approach the law within this relationship we have to Christ, it is yet another occasion for praise and thanksgiving. We should show in our Christian legal theory, fundamentally, this may not be all we show, but it's a beginning part of what we show. It's a, a minimum adequate condition for a, a theory that wants to relate uh, things to God that it do so in a way that announces the grounds for our, to, us to be thankful and joyful and to give, to give praise. So uh, we ask the question then, if we want to give praise to Christ for the law, how is the law related to Christ? If, if we know in advance that all things are related to Christ in a way, which provides occasions for joy. What's our joyful jurisprudence? What is our, our, our principle of praise in the law? And this is why I began with the, the quotation from uh, Romans 11. We know that the law is related to Christ in the way that all things are. All things are from him and through him and to him. This provides a, 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 a basic way for us to organize our thoughts. All things, the Apostle Paul says, as he's offering this litany of praise, are from him and through him and to him. To him be glory. This is the way that we want to operate with respect to law as, as well. Christians believe that all things are created by Christ, they're sustained through him, and they are fulfilled in him. They have their goal, they have their final meaning, they have their outcome in, in him. Because of Christ's role in the creation and conservation and the consummation of all things, we can praise Jesus in all things for his power, for his providence, for his promise. He creates, 
through his power. He conserves through his providence. He consummates to fulfill his promise of a new kingdom, of a, a, a new city, of a new Jerusalem. So examining specifically how this is true for law, how it is we relate the law to Christ as from him and through him and to him, how we do that specifically is a great source of unity, an essential source of unity. Wherever Christians end up talking about the law, we are going to end up in a way where we can give praise to Christ as the law being from him and through him and, and to him. We can disagree about whether this is the best way or that is the best way or whether law should be understood this way or that way. But in Jesus Christ, we will all agree we have a new relation to law. Christ has accomplished something new for us with respect to, to law. And through him, we have new grounds to give praise for it. So uh, then on the next uh, page, I begin to explore this a little further. How can we unfold this threefold relationship of Christ to all things, specifically with respect to, to the law? Well, uh, particularly we're told, for example, in the first chapter of John, all things are from Christ because Christ is the Logos. The Son of God is also to be understood as the Logos. Of God, Logos is a, a, a Greek word. Uh, it, we, we use this when we say theology. We, we use this in any of the sciences when we have an ology. That ology is the word logos. Now, logos refers to the, the principle of a thing, the, the meaning of a thing, the, the underlying significance of a thing. What sums it up. So sometimes we translate this in, in English as the word, not meaning word in the sense of a breath of air with a sound, but meaning word as in, hey, pastor, would you say a word of prayer? Would you give us a, a cohesive meaning, a, a summary of the situation we're, we're in? The Logos, we're told in John 1, is the principle of all creation. God made nothing except through the Logos. When he made the world, he didn't do it randomly. It was not an arbitrary act of will. It was in relationship to the eternal word, his eternal self-expression, a, a, an idea, a meaning, what Junius will call the eternal law. When we, when we read in Junius, we'll get to a, a port on the, the eternal law. Uh, this, is a, a, this is to anticipate, but uh, this is the sense that he means eternal law. Everything bears the mark of Christ in its origin. But even more specifically, the very idea of the, the nature of rule, as many of the early church fathers said, is somewhat mysterious. If I put an apple down by a dog, which one rules the other? Neither does. They're two separate things. For one thing to rule another, for one thing to be a measure of another, for anything to put anything into proper proportion or to provide a standard for it, requires some thing overarching the two of them, some order greater than either of them. We, we have a hard time understanding how one thing can rule another, but this is the basic idea of Christ being the Logos, Christ being the measure of all creation. Christ is the rule of rules and the standard of standards because when God created the world, he created everything good in relation to Jesus Christ. There was nothing made that couldn't be redeemed in Christ. There was nothing made that couldn't be summed up in Christ. There was nothing made that wasn't made so that all of mankind and all of creation couldn't be drawn into the drama and the glory of God's love for us through Jesus Christ. Everything is from God, so of course law is. But specifically in Jesus Christ, we have the way in which we're told God measures, God rules, 
and God relates things in order. And that is precisely the basic concept of law. And so many of the early church fathers began a tradition in, in the church of looking at the scriptures and saying, it is wonderful to consider how even our very notion of judgment and value and order is tied up in Jesus Christ. The Father's love for the Son, his putting all things under the Son, his ordering all things to the Son, is the reason why we can look out at the world and find real moral order, real orders of value, because everything has been valued and related by the Father in connection with the Son, whom he loves above all. Also, uh, we find that man is made in the image of God, and man is made to be a ruler first of the animals, and then of other people, other men. Uh, and in this way, he anticipates the role of Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the, the relationship of the Father to the Son, of Jesus Christ to his Father in heaven, we have the basic relationship that we find repeated in a different and lower sense in, in law. So that's from Christ. Next, law is through Christ. One of the basic teachings of the scriptures that urges us to faith is the events of history are not random. Now, this begins with, with Daniel looking out over the kingdoms of the earth, rising and falling, finding himself in exile in a foreign land, and being cheered with the notion that God is in control of all the risings and fallings of kingdoms, that God is judging the kingdoms of the world, that Rulers who act violently or badly or oppressively do not do so outside of any standard of measure except their power. They are actively being judged by God. And when they rebel against God, God in his time uses their very glory as an occasion for showing his glory in the world by humbling them according to his principle and his timing. God's law, God's measure is everywhere in the world, in a sense. Many people turn away from it. But in conscience, in the consensus of societies, there is enough so that the, even in public opinion, the wickedness of the world is being judged and restrained. The inadequacy of our own justice, the need that we have for divine justice and divine guidance is constantly shown to us as well. God is working out his plan to humble the nations and to exalt his people through history. He is ruling and managing history right now. It is in Christ's rule in this way that the world legal systems particularly hold together. And finally, law is specifically to or towards Christ. The, the law is not an end state. As you get more experience in the law, you, you realize this more and more. The law is good. The, the law is adequate to many purposes. But there's something unsatisfying about the law. There's something vain about the law. The law cannot accomplish its ends. Of course, this is taught to us most dramatically, as we'll talk about this semester in the very perfect law that was given to Moses. The, the law that was given through Moses is a perfect human law. It accomplishes all that a human law can accomplish. But what it can't accomplish, and this is very, very, very important, is saving people. It cannot accomplish righteousness. It fails. In its greatest task, which is to bring people into harmonious relationship with God, to make them love God, and will what God wills, it fails. It cannot overcome the sin of man. It can restrain it, it can educate it, it can improve things, but it fundamentally fails. It's a miserable failure. It's not just a failure, it's a miserable failure at a goal which it doesn't have. The, the purpose of the law was never to save men. The purpose of the law was to prepare us for Jesus Christ and a reordering of the law so that the law might begin to guide us truly in love and we might enjoy the law, not fear the law as a condemnation, not struggle uh, against our, our temptations and our desires, 
but fulfill the law through our love and salvation in Jesus Christ. Become glad obeyers of the law because of our love of, of God. As I, as I note in the essay, if you want to understand what any legal system is like, the Mosaic law, our laws today, it's like a seed compared to the fruit that will eventually grow from a tree. If you take the seed of an apple tree in your hand and you look at it, it is wonderful. The seed of an apple tree is wonderful. It bears within itself the potency, the power, the possibility of becoming a fruit-giving tree. It can feed people. It will delight with its smell. It will be beautiful. It will, it will, for many, many, many years, produce a great harvest. But if you look at it in the seed, those things are contained within it. They're not realized yet. It's a very good thing, an apple seed. But it is not an apple. And it is not only not an apple, it's not the tree that will produce the apple. For that to happen, a fundamental transformation has to happen. The seed has to be placed into the ground and die so that it may become an entirely different living thing. The good things that we anticipate in the law, those are the fruits. They are, are contained in the present law like the apples are contained in the apple seed. And you make a fundamental error if you treat the apple seed like an apple. If you eat the apple seed, you will be dissatisfied. The apple seed is not suitable to eat. It cannot sustain life. If you treat the law as something that will sustain life, you also make a mistake. The law, even the perfect law of Moses, is meant to prepare us for something. It is the possibility and the potential of something. And that something is the kingdom of God that comes with Jesus Christ. Amen? I, I wrote an article about just this point, which I reference in, in this essay, if you want a, a very long explanation of, of this point. Uh, try my article, The Christian Theology of Law, an Introduction. That's uh, it's a, Introduction is a play on words. Law is an introduction to, to the kingdom. So to sum all this up in a different way, uh, as with God's relation to all creatures, there are three relations. There are relations of causation. God creates everything. There are relations of what is traditionally called eminence. This is a theologi long-standing theological vocabulary. Relations of causation, God creates all. Relations of eminence, that is to say, God's goodness is higher than any other goodness. God's greater goodness is the source of all goodness. Whenever we find anything good, we are, as it were, in contact with something that draws us up to a greater good thing in God. This is love. Not our love, John says, but God's love. We, we, we find in our own love something which reminds us, which suggests to us, which finds its fulfillment in completion in, in God's love. Finally, after creation, causation, and eminence, there is transcendence. However much we find a relationship of causation to ourselves from God, or a relationship of eminence by which the goods that we know in this world participate in our enjoyments of, of God himself, there is in God always a transcendence. Nothing that is created in this world, nothing that we find good, is worth seeking in itself. All the goods of this world pass away. You're very fine people, but you'll die. Law is a very, very, very fine thing, but it is nothing compared to achieving unity with God in his kingdom. Everything, like law, in one way or another, draws us up to seek after that transcendent good which is higher than everything else in creation. So, to drop back down just for a second to simpler terms, 
It's just like what, what Paul said. How great is God? Everything is from him and through him and to him. In everything that you consider in the world, if you consider it right, you can consider it as an occasion for thanksgiving because it comes from God. If you think of how it is managed, how it subsists, how it comes to be that you enjoy this good thing, it's through God's control and providence and ordering of things, his interventions in the world, his gifts to you of position and location uh, and understanding and sense. And when you face the fact that ultimately none of these good things are as good as God himself, you, you grasp everything is to him. All of these things are way stations. They are, they are good, but they are mere way stations. They are stopover points that pilgrims take on their way journeying to God himself. When all of these good things will be brought up into him and transformed in a particular way. Law is a, a kind of measurement. It's an area of things we use to measure one thing. Certain kinds of human actions we measure through law. The very possibility of measurement, the very possibility of rule comes from the fact that God has created all things according to his order and his plan and his scheme of love and value. And we aren't abandoned in the world, but through Christ even now, the world is judged and managed and controlled in a way that, that brings about the will of God in history. And although it has not yet been attained, we are promised by Jesus Christ. We are assured by Jesus Christ that all the failings and difficulties of this world are being brought to perfection through his kingdom. And the day will come when we will look upon Jesus Christ and we will see written upon him, King of kings and Lord of lords. And we will shout, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Amen. So, uh, although this is really good news for, for Christians, we mostly ignore it. We, we have a lot of other things on our minds. Uh, most one else, for example, can think of nothing but, but torts. It's the most pleasurable of the subjects that they, they, they study. They can't stop thinking about it or, or reading about it. Civil procedure is a, is a, a close uh, second. And then very far, trailing way, 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 way down the list. Things that you do just out of a sense of duty <laughs> is contracts. But they're all good in their way. They're all very good in their, their, own, their own way. We're concerned, anyway, about these different subjects. We want to understand what it means for something to be a law, how it's right. We want to know how we should, what we should work for in, in the Lord. We have urgent questions about religious freedom or civil disobedience. Uh, we have all of these questions. How can we persuade other people in public to do what is, what is uh, right? And these are great topics and absolutely appropriate in their, their place. But there's something horribly wrong if you have become so disordered in your way of thinking and in your way of proceeding <clears throat> that you forget our fundamental witness of salvation and transformation and joy in Jesus Christ. The, the first thing that you have to guarantee as you try to understand law is not that you're able to wield influence over other people, not even that you're able to, to teach right and wrong in a persuasive or accurate kind of way. All those things are important in their turn. But the thing you must guarantee is that all that you do is done for the glory and understanding the glory of God and what you're dealing with. You don't have to have a theory at all, but if you do have a theory, if you do take the step of saying, I am going to try to describe to myself and to others what law is and how it should be, you better be able to explain how it is something that manifests the glory of God and provides an occasion for loving God. Not because that your theory might not be persuasive or useful in the moment, but because it misses the critical moment, the moment of your relationship to God. 
your relationship to God and Jesus Christ is one of joy and salvation. And if you understand your relationship to law in a way that excludes Christ, there is a terrible long-term consequence not only for you, but for people who are persuaded by you. They forget about the love of God. And that's horrible. The love of God is our horizon and our foundation, and responding to it with joy and faith and and love is our inspiration. The fact that we are are joyful in our relationship to God, the fact that we are thankful in our relationship to God, the fact that we are loving God more and more is our confirmation. So this should also be the same basic principle uh, of our thinking if we want to do Christian legal theory. And again, you don't have to. You can relate law. I'm on the next page now, uh, on uh, footnote 12. You can relate law to many things in creation. You can relate it to nature. People talk about natural law. Great. You can relate it to human nature. You can relate it to the standards and norms of practical reasoning. You can relate it to various measures of economic utility or or social utility or various political or goals or, as certain positivists do, to the inner logic of law itself. Nothing wrong with that. There becomes to be something wrong with it when we do any of those things to the exclusion of our account of the glory of God to the extent that we push out from the center of our hearts and the center of our minds an understanding of how these things relate us to the glory of God when we consider uh, the law. If thinking about the law makes you faithless, if it makes you joyless, if when you're doing your fundamental reflection on the law it has nothing to do with Christ, nothing to do with your faith in Christ, nothing to do with your your joy in in Christ, then you are separated in that thought from an appreciation of God's grace. And that's bad, because that's the ground of our life as, as Christians. Christians need a Christian legal theory if we don't know how to give God glory in the circumstances of our legal practice, our our legal life, if we we don't approach them with faith, if we don't approach them with hope, if we don't approach them with with love, we need a legal theory. And I propose this uh, short exercise for you. Uh, Move through the Lord's Prayer with me and and consider whether as you approach the, the Lord's Prayer, your desires are ordered, what you want are ordered as Christ teaches us, our desires should be ordered to to law. So, uh, the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, may your name be praised, may it be set apart as, as holy and worshiped. When you think about law, do you, do you have a desire that God's name be praised in relationship to law. Can you pray that prayer, hallowed be thy name, with respect to law? You should pray it with respect to all things generally. Can you pray it with respect to law? If not, you you need a Christian legal theory. After after praising him, we're we're told to, uh, to pray, your kingdom come. Do you approach the law as something that makes you desire the fulfillment of all God's plan for law in his kingdom? Are there elements of the law that you treasure and look upon and think, these will be fulfilled in Christ's kingdom? I love these now because they're like the blossoms in the spring. The the cherry trees are blossoming now. Little buds are coming up. Are they pretty? No. They look like little pieces of wood but they should fill your heart with joy because you look on them and think, I can't wait for what will come. The cherry blossoms will come and it'll be beautiful. Can you look at something in the law and say, 
Thy kingdom come. Can you desire it? Can you, can you want it? Do you do that? What do you find in the law that fills you with hope and desire for what Christ will do in the future? And next, with the good things that you have now in the law, do you pray for them as part of your daily bread? When you say, give us today our daily bread, you're praying for what sustains you, what nurtures you. What part of the law do you seek from God? Maybe it's civil order. I like not being murdered when I walk down the street. I like not having my, my goods stolen. That's why I won't move to San Francisco. I like those things. I value those things. If you are, have those things, do you, do you seek them from God? Do you say, Lord, give me what I need to sustain myself in the legal systems of the world? And when you receive them from God, do you feel gratitude? And finally, and we were talking about this a lot last semester, can you pray, lead us not into temptation? Do you, do you view accurately, as the Bible describes it and shows it, the law not simply as a technique, not simply as a series of mechanical devices, but a real place where there is a spiritual struggle going on where the, the way forward in the law is not through some kind of technical mastery alone, but a technical mastery which expresses itself in spiritual power, which is engaged in the conquest that is required of, of Christians as they engage spiritual forces. If not, you're likely to end up where the Pharisees ended up. They were great lawyers, but they became lost in the law. They became lost in it as a matter of words rather than as a powerful revelation pointing to Jesus Christ. Because although they knew the law very, very well, they didn't know the key thing. They were unable to recognize Jesus Christ to whom all the law was, was pointing. If you already do all these things, well then maybe you don't need a Christian legal theory unless you want to explain it to somebody else. If you want to explain it to somebody else, then a Christian legal theory will help you do that. If you're practicing faith, hope, and love in the law, great. But maybe somebody else isn't. And this is really important. Maybe you see a Christian who's practicing law, but they're doing so faithlessly, joylessly, without experiencing the possibility of understanding the role of Christ in their life and in their work. Maybe it's you who aren't experiencing those things. That's the purpose of a Christian legal theory. So last page, footnote 22, if you're, you're following along. So in review, Christian legal theory, our joyful jurisprudence shows as a matter of first importance the law in relation to Jesus Christ so that the grounds for praising God are clear. We know that we've understood anything properly when we understand it is from our Lord, through our Lord, and to him, and thus as an occasion for Jesus to be praised as he will universally in the second coming. When we understand how we can have confidence in Christ in the law and hope in Christ in the law and love in the law, then we have a true Christian legal theory. Why? Well, everything else has got to be false. A theory that leads us away from loving and praising God, from taking joy in the circumstances of our salvation in this life is just false. A theory that treats its subject otherwise truly, and there are lots of true statements that can be made about the law that don't include Jesus Christ. A theory that treats everything else truly but omits this key ground for loving and praising God is fatally, deadly in its incompleteness. Most basically, a theory that is not grounded on Christ isn't Christian. After we know that it will properly attribute the good of law to the goodness of God, Christian legal theory has a lot of other work to do, a lot of great work to do. But the first principles of any Christian account of the law must agree with our goal, our purpose, 
and our end, to glorify God. As our first petition, we're taught to pray is, hallowed be thy name. Our first goal in doing legal theory is to provide for the glory of God. Whatever arguments that we ultimately develop, where we say, as Christians, we say, you legislators, you governors, you judges, you rulers, you should be in favor of this and against that. You should pass this law. You should judge in this way. You should legislate in this way. All of them are going to be secondary to understanding our new relationship to law in Jesus Christ so that it provides us right now, in whatever condition the law is, with an occasion to be thankful to God and to praise and give him worship. As we reassure little children that God is still present, even in the darkness, when we're trying to put them to bed and they get afraid. So we want to be able to reassure ourselves, God's children and one another, that God is present even in societies as the apostles witnessed and Christ witnessed that are oppressive and unjust and unjust and deny God. The Father is not absent simply because he can't be seen then just as he's not absent in a child's bedroom at night. For what Christ has accomplished professing his faith in the Father's providence, even before the cruel and atheistic and cynical Pilate, in hopefully enduring the cross, and in making a spectacle of the rulers of the world, triumphing over them through his resurrection. These things are ours too. We are to follow Christ in all of these, these ways. He has transformed our legal relations, so that even in oppressive, unjust, or secular societies, we may still be grateful and guided to him. And correlatively, as we teach children to pray before they eat, to thank God and be grateful for their food, so whatever good we find in the law today, in whatever ways the law is just and well-ordered, we want to be able to give thanks to God rather than engaging in some sort of self-congratulation that we have done these great things, that we have made them. We want to give all the glory of them to God. So our distinctive goal in Christian legal under theory is to understand law as a place for grateful spiritual response to the good for law that the Father has done by sending us his Son, Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can learn to think about the law in this way a way that encourages us to praise and to love him and love our neighbors more. For as Augustine said, we seek to improve and extend our praise so that love and affection increase because when this is the case, mankind cannot but advance with a sure and firm step to a life of love and joy. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, I pray a joy and thanksgiving and peace. I pray a, a vision of Jesus Christ as he relates in the law for all of these uh, students and faculty and for myself. I pray that we may all grow in the peace that comes from knowing you and your mighty power in all things and your goodness that transcends every difficulty. Our Father in heaven, increase our faith and hope and love so that we may abound in the joy that you provide us in Jesus Christ in all occasions in our lives, but particularly, Lord, in law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.